song is long. It takes like three and a half minutes to make it all the way through. I also played the piano. How are we? Good to see you. Welcome all. Uh, my name is Pastor Ray. Grace and peace to you on this first Sunday in September. Yeah, that's where we are. All the way to September. We've made it so far. Um, you know, short story. The smallest things these days can throw us off kilter. I know for me. And so this was this week, and I was looking for my phone and like headed out the door and feeling a little rushed. And so, in order to expedite my exit, I went to my laptop and opened it up, and I did the Find My Phone feature on my laptop. I was like, this is great. I love this. And it told me that it had sent me a code in order to get into that feature, and it was sent to my phone. And it's, it's little things like that. Like, it feels like when you have a little tech glitch, like that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. I was like, the world is going to end. I just lost my marbles. You know, I was angry. I was upset. And the following day, I was in prayer. It was contemplative prayer, thinking about the data of my life with God. And God was like, it was as though God was saying to me, you know, you're in control of so little. Like, there's so little you're in control of. And your anger is really trying to wrest control of that which you have no control over. And I was like, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> I don't know about you, but there are moments in this season where I think God invites us to go deeper and to reflect and to think about, even though there are losses, how, might we, how we might be transformed through those things. And so I want to invite you <clears throat> this morning in worship, if you're with us online, and obviously if you're here, to join in the restoration of our souls as we seek to say things that are true and hopeful and good and beautiful as we walk into another week of this season and this year. 
And to that end, Bidwell has many offerings. We are offering this fall opportunities for you and for us to go deeper with Jesus Christ. So here are just a few of the ways that you can do that as we move into the fall. Number one, web for women. That starts Wednesday, September 16th at 9.30 a.m. on Zoom. Wonderful opportunity there. The Good and Beautiful Life class begins Wednesday, September 23rd at 6.30 p.m. Inspired, which is a young adult group, begins, th- or we're ongoing Thursday night, 7.30 p.m. in a backyard off of Mansion Avenue. We have a cyber cafe today on Zoom at 11 a.m. after worship. We have Presbyterian Women, which is the first Tuesday of every month on Zoom. We have Underground for Middle School, Wednesdays at 6.30, and Refuge High School meets in small groups throughout the week. So that's quite a list, and all of these are ways that we are encouraging one another to go deeper in Christ together, even in this season where we're trying to navigate new realities. uh, We can do that, and we can receive that invitation from God. So that's good news. It's good news. In light of all these invitations, I'd like you to join me in this prayer as we move into worship this morning. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we pray for your blessing on the church in this place. Here, may the faithful find salvation and the careless be awakened. Here, may the doubting find faith and the anxious be encouraged. Here may the tempted find help and the sorrowful comfort. Here may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Here may the aged find consolation and the young be inspired. To the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us worship together. Friends of Jesus, we move into a time of confession together, confessing our sins before God and longing to be restored and whole in this time. So will you pray the prayer of confession with me as I speak it over us this morning? Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, your love is hidden from us by our sins and your mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all our sins. Deliver us from proud thoughts, unbearable guilt, and vain desires, so that with strong and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our brokenness, resting in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. I now invite you just in a moment of silence to confess your sins, both 
privately and internally before God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Well, friends, my baptism was in 1986. I don't remember the day, but I do remember the year and the church and the name of the pastor, Pastor Tom Doyle. So I want you to remember this morning your baptism, not necessarily the date, if you don't know, but the promise. Listen to these words as I read the assurance over us from Titus chapter 3. It says, when God, our good and, sa and kind Savior God appeared, God saved us. Not because anything we have done, but according to God's grace. Through the water of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, we are forgiven. And friends, we can live that way. Hallelujah. Amen. And I invite you also in this time to, let's take a moment, shall we, and do what we all long to do in community and, and just say hello to one another. So <laughs> if you would, just turn to the person to your left or to your right and offer maybe a golf wave. Say hello. Pass the piece, but, you know, pass it through the air. <laughs> Yeah, welcome all. Good to see you. If you're online, we welcome you and pass the peace to you as well. Um, yeah, I'd like to offer prayers for us this morning, prayers of the people, prayers we long together to pray for hope and for healing and for our world today. So will you join me again in prayer? Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need as we gather this morning, offering our prayers of hope and longing together. Holy God, we pray that your church would be one, just as Jesus prayed. We ask that you destroy biases that distract the church from her common mission. Help the church speak the truth in love. Give the church courage to love you, love our neighbors, and be formed as disciples of our Master Jesus. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Great God, we see our children growing up in an uncertain and confusing world. Bring them safely through these days. Send your angels to guard their online learning and their laughter and keep us with them, ready to listen and love. God of mercy, hear our prayers. And on this Labor Day weekend, O oh Lord, we pray for the employed. Those who are employed, for those we are grateful. For those overemployed, O oh Lord, we ask for rest. For those underemployed, O oh Lord, we ask for increase. And for those unemployed on this weekend, O oh Lord, we pray for breakthrough. God of mercy, hear our prayers. And we ask, great God, that you would restore the city of Chico. For those looking for some sort of medical care, for those looking for employment, for those whose 2020 is already marked by significant loss, for those who need to rally, for those looking for more, for those looking for love, fighting an illness, fighting with family, that you might give provision, peace, and that they and we may encounter the living Jesus. God of mercy, hear our prayers. And we say now the prayer that Jesus gave us together, 
speaking it as he did with his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I'm going to move also into a time of offering this morning. And I came across these words this week in the Book of Confessions. You remember the Book of Confessions? This is the Confession of 1967. It reads this, God has created us in personal relation with, relation with himself that we may respond to the love of our Creator. Life is a gift to be received with gratitude and a task to be pursued with courage. I love that. All that we have is a gift to be received with gratitude. So when you give, you are saying, yeah, I recognize that life is a gift to be received with gratitude. And I believe in our leadership here. I believe in our mission here. I believe God has given me resources to share in ministry here. So we thank you for giving, and we invite you as part of your worship in a response of gratitude to give. Uh, There are several ways to do this today. You can text the word Bidwell to 77977. You can go to our website, bidwellprez.org, and click the Give button. If you're here, there is this gray bin here, and on your way out, if you have a check, you you can drop it in there. You can, of course, mail us to await First Street in Chico, and you can just, anytime I don't know, like if there's a fifth thing or someone to contact, I just say, talk to Patty. Just talk to Patty if you need another way to do that. Uh, People of God, these are the gifts of God. (laughs) Thanks be to God.
Amen. Well, what a special treat that was. Who knew that we were going to have a cellist here today? So let's thank Luca. Yay. Thank you. That was beautiful. All three of you. Wonderful. So, well, good morning to all of you. Good morning to you online. My voice seems to be giving out, and I think it has some, something to do with smoke in the air. So please excuse me as I go along. I also forgot my bug spray. I hope you brought yours. I was getting all bit up down there by mosquitoes, so um, maybe that's next week. Bring your bug spray. I don't know. But uh, Ray shared one of his frustrations with technology uh, that he had recently. I had a frustration. Um, just yesterday, and instead of anger, I went to tears. <laughs> I had bought myself this lovely indoor plant, just a little one, just a, a delicate, you know, beautiful little plant. And I was, I had this pot that I was going to put it in. And I put it in a pot yesterday morning, and it was all ready. You know, it was looked wonderful. I was excited to add it to my house, and uh, you know, I left it outside on the table where I had potted it. And a few hours later, I went out to get it fried. In just like a couple hours, the heat just totally fried it. And I was like in tears, literally. I was just so frustrated. So, <laughs> so you have technology issues. I have, you know, natural beauty issues. I don't know, you know, but um, I'm not a green thumb by any stretch of the imagination, clearly. So uh, it is kind of that time where you, where you realize, you know, there's so little that we have control over. So we are going to continue in Psalm 139, and let's look at the things, something we do have control over. How would that be? <laughs> let's join our hearts together in prayer, should we? Uh, gracious and holy God, Lord, uh, you are our God, and you are in control. And so we just praise you for that today. We thank you. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity that we can come together here, whether on the patio or watching it from home or wherever we are, and uh, just focus on you and how wonderful you are and how amazing you are. And so, Lord, may uh, the truth of this psalm that we look at today, may the truth of it sink into our hearts. May your spirit just bring these words alive to each one of us. And so, Lord, we lift this request up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, you know, we're doing three weeks on Psalm 139. Henry started last week, and he focused on the first few verses of the psalm, which teach us so much about God, right? That God is everywhere. He's all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, and very, very personal to us very intimately involved in our lives. We are known by God. And because the deepest need of the soul is to be known, God therefore satisfies the needs of our soul. And so now this week, we're going to transition into some verses that I like to call identity theft protection. So we're going to look at identity theft protection in these verses. So hear now these words, uh, verses 13 through 16. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Beautiful words. And one of the things that is so, uh, that really strikes us in these words is that we are not cookie cutter humans, are we? God does not have this cookie cutter. We are handcrafted. Each one of us is handcrafted. He has given meticulous detail to all of our inward parts, to all of who we are. Let's just pause to think about this for a minute. I mean, how cool is it that the God who created oceans, mountains, galaxies, he took time to think 
about you. And he created you uniquely in your mother's womb. I mean, that's amazing, right? The psalmist says, you created my inward parts. He's not talking about his organs. <laughs> He's talking about our minds, our souls, our personalities. It's all the handiwork of God. And then the psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, let me share with you a, a little bit more of a wooden translation from the Hebrew. A more wooden translation says, I am in awe of how I'm made by you. I am wonderfully, uniquely made by you, given an individual identity while still in the womb. Amazing. Before we could even breathe on our own, God was giving us identity, value, worth. And then the last verse that we read today says that before any of our days even came into being, they were written in God's book or the heavenly register. That means that before we were born, God has had a purpose for each one of us. We have a God-ordained purpose. So you see these verses, they teach us that our value, our worth, our purpose, our identity comes from God, our creator. Each one of us has God given value, worth, purpose. Every single one of us is fearfully and wonderfully made. The person in the grocery store who isn't wearing their mask, fearfully and wonderfully made. The transient I passed yesterday in Lower, in lower Park who was literally pushing all of their belongings in a cart, fearfully and wonderfully made. The neighbor with a political sign down the street that's completely opposite of my political beliefs, fearfully and wonderfully made. The teenagers who egged my house a couple weeks ago, fearfully and wonderfully made. You see, doesn't just apply to me, does it? It applies to each one of us. Now, why do we need this information? Why do we need to know this? Well, first of all, the Bible in and of itself is a book of identity. God's identity and our identity. Through and through, there are stories about who God is and who we are. But we also need this information because each one of us, each one of us is susceptible to identity theft. Have you ever been the victim of identity theft? Has anybody? Has anybody had? Okay, so you know, I have too. Okay, I have too. When I was in my 20s, I lived in New York City. And uh, one evening after work, I, I went right from work to have coffee with a friend. And I always carried around a big bag. <laughs> My whole life was in that bag because I walked 30 blocks from home to, to, to work and then back home. So I had my shoes in there, my makeup. I had my whole life, really, which was kind of dumb, but I did. You know, I had my wallet with all my credit cards, my checkbook. Uh, I don't even know if I had a cell phone back then, but if I did, it was probably the size of a brick. <laughs> you know, those old cell phones. Probably that was in there. I had something so ancient that's called a day planner. <laughs> <laughs> right? Where it's just, you know, it's this big book and you have your calendar in there, all your addresses, everything, your whole, your whole life right there. Now we have it in our smartphone. But it used to be in a day planner. That was in there. Guess what else was in there? My Bible. Little pocket-sized Bible. But do you know what? All, the, all my favorite verses highlighted, pages dog-eared, even in the little margins I wrote notes, that Bible went everywhere with me. So it was all in my bag. My whole life was in there. Come on, why not? <laughs> so I'm having coffee with a friend. We're done with our coffee. I go to grab my bag from under my chair, and it's not there. <laughs> Gone. No, it can't be. It's got to be here somewhere, right? <laughs> so I went up to the counter. No, nobody's turned in a bag. OK, starting to get fearful. Well, maybe my bag is really gone. My friend and I, we run out, we go, we, this is what you're supposed to do. It's gross, but you're supposed to go through all the garbage cans, you know, within a couple blocks radius because somebody probably took your wallet and then just threw out your bag. Nah, it wasn't anywhere, gone. 
My keys to my apartment were in there, right? Everything was in my bag. So that wasn't bad enough. <laughs> that wasn't bad enough because actually, well, the next day I went and I filed a police report, but of course, you know, what is that? What's, what's really going to happen? I canceled my credit cards, take, took care of the checks, got new keys made, blah, blah, blah. Did all that stuff. But then a month later, I started getting bills from credit cards I had never opened. Hundreds of dollars of clothes had been bought in my name. I, I got a credit card bill for um, somebody who just kept buying gas for their car with this particular credit card. So here I am owing hundreds of dollars and uh, I had to go through a process. Those of you who have had this happen to you, there's a process you have to go through. And it, for me, it was a seven year recovery. Seven years recovery from that. What do you think that did for me? A myriad of feelings, right? Grief. Honestly, the thing I was saddest about was losing my Bible because it was so personal to me. But anger, I had this kind of constant creepy feeling, right? That somebody knew so many things about me out there. I had insecurity because they had the keys to my apartment. I mean, certainly I had the locks changed and there was, my address wasn't written on the keys, but just knowing that somebody has your keys gives you a little insecurity. I felt powerless. I felt this sense of loss. For a long time, I felt uncomfortable in the world. You know, I just felt uncomfortable in the world. Now I have to say, we are all prone to identity theft. Now I don't just mean literally in the way it happened to me, but yes, that's true too. I am speaking about being prone to letting our God-given identity be stolen. We're all prone to that. What do I mean by that? What are some of the things that rob us of our identity? Well, perhaps it's a, a negative message that we received in our childhood that has defined us ever since. You know, if we perceive as children that we don't measure up, we're going to carry that uh, I'm not good enough message around our whole lives. You know, someone very close to me grew up being told as a child that she wasn't smart. In fact, the word her dad used was you're stupid. And so she grew up thinking she was not smart, that she was stupid. And so it prevented her from doing a lot of things in her life because she just believed she didn't have the brains for it. Stole her identity, that message. Another thing that can rob us of our identity is actually a particular talent or a gift that we have that God gave us. It can easily become what we identify ourselves with. You know, when I was a little girl, I had my favorite female athletes, Dorothy Hamill. Who didn't want hair like Dorothy Hamill? Oh, yeah, I wanted to skate like her, too, but I really wanted her hair, right? Mary Lou Retton, the gymnast. Chris Everett Lloyd, the tennis player. Oh, we have a tennis player here. I know you must know who I'm talking about. Chris Everett Lloyd. She was amazing, right? She had how many years? She had 74 to 78, then 80 to 81. She was the number one singles player in the U.S. Amazing. She was, and then after she retired, about a decade after she retired, she was being interviewed. And the interviewer was asking her about the transition into retirement after being this superstar tennis player. And this is what she's told the interviewer. She said, I had no idea who I was or what I could be away from tennis. I was completely lost, like being hooked on a drug. I needed the wins, the applause, in order to have an identity. This God-given talent that she had been given robbed her, took over her identity, didn't it? And that brings up another thing that can rob us of our identity, success. You know, some personalities are more prone to this than others, but we can feel sometimes like we're a nobody when we're not succeeding at something. It, it robs us of our true identity. And then we can let a specific role identify us, being a parent, a spouse, a caregiver. 
Do you know what's an interesting observation? Try this sometime. When you meet somebody for the first time, ask them to tell you a little bit about themselves and see if they don't first identify themselves as their role. I'm a parent, I'm a wife, I'm a pastor, right? We let our roles identify us. Another identity thief can be a failure or a chronic illness. You know, you'll hear recovering alcoholics say that they have the disease of alcoholism, but it is not the whole of who they are, and they're right. Because your gambling addiction doesn't identify you, your lupus doesn't, your failed business that you tried to keep going for so long, those things are not your identity. And your identity can be stolen by so many other things. Your possessions, where you live, the status that you have, the, the amount of power you might have in a given sphere of life. And unfortunately, relationships can steal our identity because they become our identity if we let them. I love how one of my professors in my doctorate program, uh, he's a professor, but he's first and foremost a pastor at a, a Methodist church in South Africa. And whenever he's speaking about his wife, he never says, my wife, Debbie. Instead, he says, Debbie, the woman I'm married to. And he would say this every time he'd talk about her. And finally, we were like, why are you, wait, can you stop for a minute? Why are you identifying her this way? And he said, because when we got married, she told me she never wanted to be the pastor's wife. That was not her identity. You see, relationships can really rob us of our identity. So when all is told, there are quite a few things, aren't there, that can steal our true identity. And when they do, we do feel a bit uncomfortable in the world, like I felt when my identity was literally stolen. We can feel uncomfortable in the world that way. You know, something that's also really interesting, and it would be fun to kind of go around and talk about this if we could, but how has COVID or sheltering in place maybe hit you in that spot of your identity or your purpose? I mean, think about it. In March, we couldn't go to work. <laughs> we couldn't hang out with friends. We couldn't do a lot of the hobbies that we have. I don't know about you, but that hit me in a place. How do we identify ourselves when all that stuff is taken away and we can't, right? Imagine living, being in a job where what you do is be with people. <laughs> and then you wonder, what is my purpose? This is a perfect time for us to meditate on this and to return to our true identity in God. And the psalmist has it right. He's got it right for us. It's because he knows who he is and he knows whose he is, right? It protects us from identity theft when we know who we are and whose we are. And let's take a look for a moment at what the psalmist does with this information. He says this, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He, his posture here is one of praise, of worship of God. You see, this psalm is not intended to be a feel good about yourself, you know, raise your self-esteem psalm. It's not. That's not why he's saying these words. He's giving God the credit, not himself. He's saying, oh my gosh, before I was even born, you knew everything about me. You are amazing, right? So he addresses his maker with adoration and love, and he humbles himself. He knows his right place. He knows his place and his relationship with his maker. I love um, this uh, Christian psychologist and author, David Benner, um, He's, he's written a lot of great books on this, but he says this in one of his books, the foundation of our identity resides in our life-giving relationship with the source of life. Any identity that exists apart from that relationship is an illusion. It's an illusion. 
We are not our jobs. We are not our talents. We're not our roles. We're not our relationships or our status or our illness or our possessions. And we are not here to serve our own purposes. We're not. But we so quickly forget this, don't we? We can so quickly forget this. I love this line from a book by Father Richard Rohr, and maybe some of you read Richard Rohr. He has a book called The Immortal Diamond, and he says, life is not a matter of creating a special name for ourselves, but of uncovering the name we have always had. Uncovering the name that we have always had. Do you ever have a moment where you're in your sweet spot, where you're using a talent or you're connecting with someone or you you have this sense of like, yeah, this is what I'm created to do. Oh yeah, I'm in it. It's like you remember this is what God created me to do. We have those beautiful moments where we're like, oh yeah, there she is. There I am. (laughs) Those are beautiful moments. And think of the best story of two people who knew who they were and whose they were from the the moment they were created. What story am I talking about? Adam and Eve, right? This is the perfect story. They are an example of what the psalmist is talking about. We are told that God created them specially, very special, very different than the rest of the things that he created. They were given good gifts from God, a, a place to live, a beautiful home, beautiful trees to eat from. They were given a purpose. They were to care for all these things. And they were given a boundary to respect. They were given a humble place. We're told that they were naked and not ashamed. They did not know shame. They had no shame. Nothing to be ashamed of. Beautiful place. They knew who they were and whose they were. But what happened then? A serpent entered the scene, right? and stole their identity. Remember what the serpent did? It convinced the humans that there was actually a better identity out there for them. Oh yeah, you've got that one? Oh no, you could be just like God. There's a better identity for you out there. And they took the, they took the bait, right? They took the bait. And as soon as they did, They became very uncomfortable in this world. (laughs) They became riddled with shame. They became fearful and they hid from God. And finally, God, the one who, who loves his creation, he accommodated them, right? He provided clothing for them. He gave them a new place to live and some, some new roles. But if you read the story, God never abandoned them. God still continued to be in relationship with them despite the fact that using Richard Rohr's words, their names were now covered. They let a slimy serpent steal their God-given identity. And then their sons went on, and their sons went on, and generations of this continued until sin just covered people's true identity can happen, can it? Friends, each one of us, the psalm reminds us, it, it's reminding us, don't forget, each one of us is fearfully and wonderfully made by a loving God who gives each one of us worth and purpose. And that's why it's so important for us to stay in these psalms, to to read these psalms, to read scripture that will remind us of our true identity, to be in. That's why it's so great that we're, we're really kind of hunkering down in this psalm right now, because it reminds us of the things we so easily forget. It's protecting us from identity theft, really. Now, don't get me wrong, though, right? Our true selves are not perfect. We're not perfect. Even when we're living in our true identity, we are not perfect. But we participate in a relationship with the one who is perfect. And we're fortunate, we're so fortunate, to have someone who saved us 
from completely losing our identities to sin, who ransomed us, who bought us back from the grips of sin, and who wants to help us uncover what our true identity is. And of course, I'm talking about our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us and was resurrected. And he extends to us the same pattern of life if we follow it. We can die to all those false identities and rise up to be more and more of the person we were truly created to be. Friends, let us remember who we are and whose we are. Let us protect ourselves from identity theft. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, Lord, you are holy and you are transcendent and powerful and all-knowing. But, and, you are personal and loving and caring and you are with us every step of the way. And Lord, we do indeed praise you and worship you for making us the way you made us. And so, Lord, may each one of us just take this time when we have a little extra time when we're not able to do all the things that we normally do or uh, just go the places that we normally go, help us to just really lean into and learn and know in our hearts what our true identity is, that it begins and it ends with you. So we praise you for that, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of being your little image bearers, that we can walk around this world as your little image bearers and that we can see each other that way as well. So Lord, be with us now and as we go into this week, and we just praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. awesome. And you are awesome. You're awesomely made by an awesome God. So friends, let us go from here today knowing who you are and whose you are, that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And just let your life praise God and worship God in that identity. So let us go now with the love of Jesus, the grace of our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Let it be flowing in and through us today and every day. May it be so. Amen. Have a good week.